And uh, we're coming uh, toward the last presentation here. Dr. Yasa is my partner and she's gonna talk about uh, EVAR explantation. Ines? Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Thank you for uh, um, the invitation to talk here and uh, review um, what is a very large topic of EVAR explantation. Um, regarding disclosures, none relevant to this talk, I will tell you I'm an equal opportunity graft explanter. I've explanted them all and um, had the same uh, discomfort when I go to implant it in the next patient. So to kind of give you an overview, I mean, you know, these are just a couple of examples of patients that we've taken for EVAR explantation. You know, what you can see here in example number one to the far left of the screen, you know, clearly a neck um, that perhaps dilated the graft is slipped. It's sitting nicely in the aneurysm sac. Um, I can't remember, but this may be, um, you know, one of the original aneurex type grafts um, where this was prone to happen. You know, seeing in the middle of the screen, this is a graft with super renal fixation. You can see the neck has dilated and we have contrast sneaking around it with a um, type 1A endo leak despite the super renal fixation. And then here on the far right, you can see that uh, everything under the sun was attempted to try and endovascularly salvage this endograft, including onyx, coiling, uh, proximal um, cuff extension, palmas, um, uh, the limb slipped backwards. We did a bridging um, covered stent from the common into the hypo and a fem fem to exclude a large 1B and on the end, um, it all had to come out. So truly, um, you know, whatever it is, it, we've had to take it out, unfortunately. Um, so ultimately, what I'd say is much like Eric Verhoeven's group, um, what we've seen is that the most common thing that we're dealing with is a type 1A endo leak. And I think his um, meta-analysis here summarized quite nicely, you know, even in the best of circumstances across all comers and all EVARs, a 25% neck dilatation rate observed over nine years. And I think that's something it behooves us to keep in mind. And as we'll see as we go on, um, you know, if you're 20% oversizing an endograft and you have a 25% neck dilatation rate in nine years, well, 10 years from now, you might be looking at something that's not working anymore. I think this is not news to us now, but certainly, unfortunately, um, in our earlier years of endograft implantation, um, something that we didn't always have line of sight to and has, I think, put us in this position now where we're having to late um, graft explant endovascular grafts. Um, we can see from this series um, from the Cleveland Clinic, again, kind of reiterating that the majority of indication for graft explant, certainly with some patients having more than one indication, um, but the majority in their series was a type one endo leak, some of them present um, on initial seal uh, or initial um, operation, and those people often having to go on to explant within one year, and some of them presenting um, more than five years later, so in that group of subsequent neck dilatation. Other indications for um, EVAR explantation listed here, but I think um, the data tells us um, clearly that the most common indication remains the type 1A endo leak, and I think we can all agree likely secondary to um, migration secondary to um, ongoing growth at the seal zone. Um, you can see from the Cleveland Clinic's um, series here, you know, the mortality, um, you know, when patients are much further out, um, a little bit lower, but in those early years, um, mortality higher than we'd like to see for an original open repair, certainly. Um, oh, let me click again here. And so, you know, I think Going again to the um, mortality uh, on the elective basis, you know, their series from the Cleveland Clinic showing a 9.9% .9 mortality um, for late or uh, for graft explant or EVAR explantation, excuse me. And then when we're talking about the non elective, the infected grafts, as Dr. Moab just recently spoke about, the aortoenteric fistulas, as we brought up, and even emergent indications for rupture, um, obviously significantly higher rates, um, mortality rates. But even in the elective setting, a higher mortality rate than most of us would like to see for our um, primary open repairs. Um, you know, I, I 
bring up this great series as well, um, compelling data from Pittsburgh and uh, Mike Macroon's group, um, just pointing out the complexity of explantation um, and the increasing frequency of graph or EVAR explantation. Um, 65 cases included in this series where they attempted to graft preserve those who presented with endoleak non-ruptured, um, obviously showing a better um, or improved rather, oh, excuse me, my screen is not clicking. There we go, thank you. Um, showing uh, better mortality rates and across the board, um, decreased complication rates when the graft could be preserved. Um, and then as we take a subset of those who went on to actual graft explantation and look at, you know, what are the predictors of their ongoing mortality, inevitably, again, presentation with rupture, infection, as we spoke about, and the need for a supraceliac clamp, um, often, you know, kind of increasing or, or independently increasing the likelihood of mortality. Um, you know, I think this um, data also shows nicely how just the presentation of an endo leak, even without rupture, um, when we plot that for um, overall survival, that presentation um, is lower, or that uh, survival rate is lower than those um, with no endo leak. So, you know, I think we're all familiar with the data out of Europe that has um, led to some decision making that we may or may not agree with regarding when should endografts be implanted, um, et cetera. And I think, you know, while we don't necessarily want to go so far as to say never, of course, but I think we want to be mindful of the fact that endoleaks are not to be trifled with, and certainly even unrepaired endoleaks, um, endoleaks presenting without rupture, um, are things we want to pay attention to because should they present, uh, go on to present with rupture, of course, we're looking at significant mortality rates when we try to explant. So why is that? Again, I'd um, postulate that for years we've been pushing ourselves outside um, IFU limitations. You know, I think we can all attest to that, um, a little bit of a look at what I can do, um, look at how I can help this person outside of the um, normal um, plans and boundaries. And that's great. We have a lot of tools that we can offer patients. And, you know, these are just two examples of papers. Um, no major difference in outcomes for endovascular aneurysm repair um, when placed outside of instructions for use. Long-term results outside of instructions for use for EVAR, very promising. More recently, I think this was a very compelling paper by Drs. Chandra Lee and, and Dahlman from Stanford just demonstrating, even on IFU, um, maybe we need to rethink this. The larger device patients are associated with a higher risk of proximal fixation failure and ultimately putting them at risk for type 1A endoleak and ultimately um, impacting survival and putting them in a position as we've seen in the earlier data that um, we presented from other papers, potentially needing graft explantation or some form of attempt to graft salvage. So, you know, bringing it back to what I was initially um, tasked with presenting, what are the tips for explantation? So I'll um, give uh, Dr. Mawad here um, props. Uh, he provided me with these pictures specifically. But, you know, when I take someone for a graft explant or we in my group take someone for a graft explant, you know, what are the things that are in front of mind that I talk to the residents and the trainees about and we prepare each other for a significant amount of periaortic inflammatory change. That patient that I showed who had every, you know, modality under the sun to try and attempt to salvage that endograft, just an immense amount of inflammation um, around the um, endograft or around the aneurysm sac, um, you know, consider ureteral stents. I have found that to be immensely helpful just because of the amount of inflammation. It's not the same as going in for a de novo or primary open repair. Just, you know, that ongoing creeping, enlarging sac and the attempts at intervention to try and salvage it can create an immense inflammatory response. Um, so I have found, again, ureteral stents um, in advance to be incredibly helpful. Um, you know, I would say the majority of infrarenal grafts um, can be safely explanted with a temporary suprarenal clamp. If you've got one that has been so kind as to completely slip into the aneurysm sac, you might not need a suprarenal clamp at all. Um, and so, you know, certainly improving um, those odds. And as we saw in the series from uh, Pittsburgh, the presence of a need for a supraceliac clamp ultimately significantly increasing the um, mortality of the operation. So if you, you know, as anyone would, clamp as low as you can to get the graft out. 
And then think about, you know, can I leave portions of the graft in? Um, you know, I think we talked about that initially in the case presented um, at the beginning of this session, you know, what can you safely leave in? As you can see here um, in these pictures, um, you know, this was an endograft attempted to be relined with another endograft. Um, ultimately, I find the endologics, you know, for better or for worse, are often the easiest to explant. Um, they do kind of, you know, with the um, absence of the wire on the outside, I find them, they slip out quite nicely. Not a lot of additional maneuvers I found necessary. Um, although having wire cutters on hand um, is often helpful if you're having to explant graft in graft. Um, you know, and then um, for those who are not familiar or have not had themselves in the position to have to do this, um, this is a technique that I have used both for explanting T-VARs with active fixation and um, inferenal E-VARs with active fixation. So again, this is nicely described here initially by this group from the Netherlands. Um, using the um, uh, 20 cc syringe, kind of taking off the um, the uh, syringe part of it, um, shaving that down a little bit so it doesn't have sharp edges, um, taking out the limbs of your um, inferenal graft first if you can, or at least transecting and separating, securing a little tie to the um, body of the um, bifurcated component of the device, and then sliding your um, syringe over it. Um, with gentle sort of um, downwards tension on the tie and on the endograft, followed by, you know, kind of just slow and um, consistent upwards pressure on the syringe. Most of the time, those active fixation barbs will disengage from the aortic wall um, and uh, will, you know, leave you with a non-damaged aortic wall. Um, uh, like I said, um, this is not an inferenal EVAR, but this was that technique used ultimately for a T-VAR that had to be explanted after both a thoracoabdominal um, repair uh, presented with infection was relined with a T-VAR in an effort to um, stop the um, bleeding that was likely coming from the intercostal patch, um, and then ultimately required all of it to be explanted. Um, as the infection was refractory and the hem um, hemoptysis was refractory. So in this technique, we use that similar technique, the syringe technique as described, um, and it uh, worked quite nicely for the active fixation barbs on the um, thoracic endograft that was in place. Um, again, consider your indication, I think, for explant. We can all agree that if you are, um, you know, um, explanting for an endo leak, Avoid, if you can, the suprarenal um, or uh, trying to remove the suprarenal fixation. Um, even in the setting of infection, I will tell you, um, you know, we uh, multiple series have shown and, you know, or, or multiple papers, rather, case reports have shown if you can just cut the majority of that fabric off um, and sew to the suprarenal fixation um, barbs reinforcing with a felt strip, um, you know, that. Um, leftover metal without fabric is unlikely to be an ongoing source of infection. Now, of course, if what you're dealing with is, um, you know, an aortoenteric fistula, that may not be an option. Um, again, um, you know, liberal use of icing for any endograft that you want to explant, whether it's got super renal or active fixation or not. So oftentimes we'll bring sterile ice onto the field and that'll kind of shrink the endograft uh, down away from the wall and allows us to remove it uh, much easier if the self-expanding component is limiting us from being able to really pull as comfortably as we'd like to. Um, I will say, you know, for um, those with active fixation, I will often do both. I will liberally ice as well as, um, you know, use the syringe trip to try and uh, shrink the um, active fixation away from the wall. And I have found that um, to help. It certainly doesn't make it easy um, or as easy to explant as something that doesn't have active fixation and is completely infrarenal, but certainly has facilitated. So, you know, why are you explanting? I think that's a big question, um, you know, that you want to know first, of course, and you almost always will, but in your head there, if you can leave parts behind, um, the limbs behind and sew to them, if you're explanting for a type 1A, for example, um, you know, we leave the limbs behind and just sew to them, incorporating them into our distal anastomoses of the endograft. Um, or of the new graft rather. Um, again, I would, um, I can't speak enough about 
um, the, the use of felt strips when I'm sewing to endograft and aortic wall. Um, you know, not a thing I use every time I do an open aneurysm repair, but for these types of settings, I found it to be incredibly helpful. Um, so um, I, uh, you know, I think that's, um, you know, kind of covers a lot, hopefully, uh, hopefully helpful to some extent. You know, I think the compelling piece is, you know, if we can make decisions to the best of our ability to avoid this in the future, use the lessons of the past, that's ideal. And I think inevitably there will be more graft explants or EVAR explants in all of our future. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present. That was very nice, Ines. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, a discussion, the question in the chat about using, uh, it's difficult with a small diameter syringe, so you can use like a larger syringe uh, if you had to. Um, and then cutting the fixation, I think. Uh, so uh, you said wire cutters. So in, in a zenith graft, for example, you would be cutting the fabric out uh, with wire cutters or scissors, or how do you do that? Um, yeah, we. I have um, just used you know regular shears, kind of interchanging between um, you know a heavy pair of scissors to cut the fabric, and then you know every time you come across a metal tine. Um, using the fine wire cutter, um, just, you know, particularly um, in, you know, the smaller operative field or a smaller graph, just easier to get those smaller wire cutters in place. Um, the, um, you know, I've, I've tried to use bigger scissors and, you know, depending on um, how small and far away that neck is and that graft is, it may be difficult to get in. But yeah, it's those who it's worked for, I think that's great. I agree with you. Yeah, thanks very much. That was a nice review. Um, and one, uh, one comment, Ash, um, this is Rob Molnar. One thing I've tried is a Ramel tourniquet with a umbilical tape and a red rubber and get it down on that super renal fixation and sort of slide it up. And that seems to really compress it well. Yeah, that's another good trick. And is, uh, so I, on my first Zenith explant, I used uh, some ice slush and it's amazing how that changes. It makes the graft more malleable and it really helps the tines uh, get out of the aortic wall, which, uh, uh, which is like, you, you can cause a lot of injury if you're pulling on the tines uh, when they're embedded in the aortic wall. So yeah, when, when you're doing these cases, you, you just wanna use every trick in the book really uh, to make it go well. Explanted ovation. Anybody in the group explanted an ovation graph? Um, yeah, I will. Um, I think uh, um, one of our partners and myself had the pleasure of explanting an ovation. Um, it was for the indication of a persistent type 1A endo leak. Um, so we did not, um, you know, we, we left the crown in place. Um, you know, we clamped um, with the, uh, so the ovation had actually gone inside and endologics in an attempt to salvage that. Um, ultimately not successful, unfortunately. Um, so we did, you know, honestly, we did not get a super renal or a super celiac clamp in. We used a um, balloon um, and uh, just took a balloon up, put that kind of in the region of the cage um, rather than clamping. And then once we were able to open the aneurysm sac, um, we had to open the endologic, so there was wire cutters involved there. Um, and then we just trimmed the ovation and left the um, fabric rim uh, beneath the large crown. Um, and then once we were able to um, get a clamp there, then, or, um, or uh, once we were able to sew that, then the balloon was able to come out. 